Just the side of YouTube. Hello. Is there anybody out there? What's up? Whoa, there's lots of people out there. Brian Street says long sleeves in Ecuador. Man, you have acclimated, my friend. <laughs> long sleeves. That's right. You know, this this happens occasionally. And if you've watched my videos over the years, you do see that every once in a while, um, the violence of circumstance forces me to wear shirts. Um, I don't know. I prefer not to. I mean, I, shoot, if I could hang out naked in the sun all day, that's what I would be doing. Well, not all day. But um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not of clothing. I'm public, <laughs> right? Uh, so... All right, I think I'm back. <laughs> All right, look, today and yesterday, my internet service has been terrible. Um, <laughs> All right, Brian Street says food, big food industry is jamming his signal. Clearly, clearly, Illuminati infiltration into my signal. <laughs> All right, I hope my connection stays solid. If it gets really bad, somebody comment and I'll call it a day. But I'll try and get this done. What's up, everybody? I have survived. I'm back. <laughs> Keto with Honey Bunny says, anyone else feel evil and demonic when they detox from artificial sweeteners? No. <laughs> I don't know. I've never been – artificial sweeteners have never been a big part of my diet. So that's not something I could comment on, Keto with Honey Bunny. Are you having, are you having a major sugar exorcism going on right now? It's funny, you use the extreme language, right? Like demonic and evil. 
But I totally know what you're talking about, though. When you really, when you're, when you're sick, when you're like, ah, um, when you're stressed out, that feeling that you get of just oppression of like, you'll get the repetitive thoughts and stuff like that, that can inform the sickness or make you focus on the wrong thing when you're sick. You know, like if I get really sore, if I get an injury, my mind is prone to like psych psychotically obsessing over the little bit of pain that I'm experiencing. So I do have to come up with mechanisms to actually calm myself. And, you know, I mean, people, people comment a lot of the times on the videos, they talk about, Oh, you know, you seem so calm. You seem so relaxed. You seem so together or your life is so peaceful. Um, you know, this is, this is what I show here. Right. So, I mean, a lot of the times I get up here and I'm talking, shoot, I am just talking to myself when I'm doing this basically, right? I mean, yes, I get your guys comments and I try to interact with you, but I don't feel you in front of me. I don't see you in front of me. I just see the words. So like when I'm up here talking half the time, I'm talking to myself, trying to reiterate the things that I'm learning and implementing day by day to try to make my life better. Um, cause I don't have all the answers. Um, if I did, I wouldn't be here in a human body. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Keto with honey bunny. Enjoy your artificial sweetener exorcism. It's your choice. What thoughts you submit to, what thoughts you allow to reverberate in your mind, and what you flow through that vessel. So when you feel all that, ah, I need the sweeteners. You must eat this. I don't know. What is it, what is it that you're addicted to? The, uh, the aspartame or something like that? Come eat me. Eat me. The sugar-free gum. Um, the Diet Cokes. You know, um, Say no. It's your life. It's your body. And you decide what you put into it. Virginia Beach is tuning in. William Laurel, what's up? Pamela, hello, Pamela. Brian Street, what's up, Brian? Briar Rose says he's on his tablet instead of his phone. Uh, so maybe on tablets, I don't know, maybe for some reason on these devices, my live things don't work. Hmm. All right, Melissa says, I started eating this way for my T1, type 1 diabetes, I'm guessing. Almost got a sneeze there. False alarm. And it was a game changer for a year, fell off, and now I'm trying to get back on. I've had high sugars and put back on all my weight. I need to get my mindset back. Yeah, that's what's up, Melissa. You understand. It's not just, oh, well, I know to eat this food and that food, and if I eat this food and that food, I'm going to get this result. It's actually about the mind state. It's actually about the mindset. It's about taking control of our actions, taking responsibility for our decisions. That's one of the biggest ones right there, right? Owning it. It's like I, your language right there, you're owning it. You're ready to move forward. You're telling me I was on it for a year. I got off. I fell off and now I'm trying to get back on. So maybe instead of trying to get back on, you decide that you're going to get back on. And it might sound like I'm just playing linguistic games, but I'm not. You know what I'm talking about deep down inside. It's like, oh, I'm trying. I'm trying to be nicer. I'm, I'm trying to quit smoking. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to quit drinking. But it's just so hard. No, you know when you really decide to do something, when it's time, if you hit rock bottom, when you say no more, when you actually exert your will, that's when things happen. We got to stop trying and faking trying you know, putting on this dog and pony show like you're in, you know, middle, we're not in school anymore, right? There's no taskmaster here as adults keeping us in line, keeping our minds straight and keeping our habits clean. We got to do it. We got to clean up our house. We got to clean up our room. We got to take control of the thought processes that drive and inform the decisions we make and the habits that make the body we live in. Oh, guess what, guys? I had carbs today. And I'm going to, I'll show you later. It's, it's a meager, disappointing amount of carbs. But um, yeah, you know, the last few times on these live hangouts, we have talked about using carbohydrates in a targeted fashion in certain contexts. And one of the contexts I talked about before was intense training that involves both anaerobic and aerobic with oxygen, like running, aerobic activity, running, walking, distance, endurance, cardiovascular activity along with intense, heavy glycogen usage, like sprinting and stuff like that. So athletes who might be playing soccer, football, as you Europeans may say, um, or everyone else in the world except crazy America. Um, so if you're playing football or American football um, or anything where you need high aerobic and anaerobic activity, like MMA fighters, stuff like that, 
more carbohydrates around training can facilitate those bursts of intense energy. And you would be surprised at how little extra carbohydrate you actually need in those situations. Now, I'm not talking about for the average individual just losing body fat on a ketogenic diet. If you've got 50, 60, you know, 20 or 100 <laughs> pounds to lose, then using carbohydrates in this way not going to be necessary. And if you've got long-term keto adaptation, it might not make that much of a difference in your performance as well. Um, it's something I like to do every once in a while. And I do like to use, I mean, there's certain carbohydrate-based foods that agree with me, that make me feel good. Um, I've always been a big fan of improving nitric oxide flow, getting your nitric oxide levels up and beet and carrot juice is what I had earlier. I did a run to town. I don't know how far it is. Probably. How long does it take to walk to town? I don't even know maybe a couple of miles, including lots of sprinting, lots of intense activity on the way there. And um, when I got to town, I had a little espresso. Oh, there's another thing, right? Uh, you're not allowed to have coffee on a ketogenic diet. If you drink coffee, you're subhuman. You cannot keto adapt. Um, anyway, I also had an espresso in town. Um, I'll do like a full day of eating with carbs video. I got some footage. I actually used the, the GoPro to do a, a long time lapse of my run to town. And, uh, but yeah, it was nice. I had about 30 grams of carbs from a carrot beet ginger juice, all fresh pressed vegetables. Um, and I enjoy it. So there you go. It's not about dogma. It's not about how high are my ketones now? Am I burning ketones or am I a loser? That's not how we gauge progress, right? I mean, I've been doing a ketogenic diet for, I don't know, three, four years. I'm not counting. It's not a competition. But I find that adding some carbohydrates now and then can be enjoyable, and I don't even really notice. That's what's funny is before when I do high carbohydrate or when I'd eat a lot of carbs, I didn't have as much self-control, and I didn't understand how to properly use them. But now after long-term keto adaptation, it seems like when those carbs do get titrated in or undulated in or periodized in or whatever word you want to use for it, I take it up, and I'm done with it. So, yeah, that was my lunch today. A vegan raw <laughs> fresh pressed vegetable juice. The vegans will be happy. The keto files, the uh, <laughs> I don't know, the ketone worshippers will be upset. Unsubscribe now if you're offended. I ate some carbs today, and I don't feel guilty, and I don't feel ashamed. In fact, I feel the same. <laughs> uh, I don't even notice when I drink coffee too. That's another funny thing. I like the taste of coffee. I like the idea of some of you know a lot of the research on coffee and polyphenols and stuff like that. But I had that espresso, and I don't think I really felt it. Um, I was already so vasodilated from the run, and um, had that kind of runner's high, even though my legs were a little jelloy. Now I'm a little tired, but it felt good. Michael Martinez, what's up? Mutant Stoner checking in. DeWitt Sagastoom says, hello, Tristan and Jessica. Love you so much. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. St. Louis checking in. Richard, what's up, bud? Brent, what's up? California checking in. Hemet. Oh, man, that's cool. Hemet. Dave, what's up, man? Brian Street said the shirt was too much interference for his transmission. Yeah, it was jammed. The shirt was just too much. Now it's getting warmer, and I'm wearing a long sleeve. Just might have to change that. All right, everybody. We got a question from DeWitt. I, can I use maca while breastfeeding? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, um, <clears throat> a member of the medical priesthood. Um, I have not been anointed by the gods of the modern age, the scientists behind the American Heart Association. And the American Medical Association prostrate before them. Uh, I'm not certified by any of these lettered organizations to give you medical advice. Uh, so consult your, your doctor in your next family doctor visit when you're being prescribed drugs and uh, to cover up the symptoms. And But I will say that. Totally, yeah. My my wife ate maca while breastfeeding the whole dang time throughout her pregnancy, and that little boy came out curly haired, chubby. Actually, he wasn't chubby when he came out. He was a skinny little butt boy, but now he's curly haired, chubby, happy, healthy boy walking around at ten months, acting like he's two years old already. Kivi Kova says, "P.S. Everybody should buy their buy your book. It's the least they could do for all the great free info that you give out." Kivi Kova, your check is in the mail. Thank you. 
King Six says, first off, great cookbook. A question. Why have I stopped losing fat slash weight on a keto diet after a while and after adding carbs around workouts? I lost six key kg in a month. Well, that's interesting. So it sounds like what may have been happening with you, you may have been burning the candle at both ends with a restricted calorie diet, with not giving yourself enough substrate through fats or carbohydrate to actually create the glucose needed in these intense anaerobic workouts. I don't know what your workouts were, but adding some of those carbohydrates, the oats and fruit, we got what simple and complex carbohydrates in there, you actually were probably able to increase the intensity of your workouts and feel a little bit better and get the results that you desired. So it's not because you weren't eating enough fat, bro. It might just be because that's what suited you in the moment, right? We, not, we might not even be able to nail down the one reason or come up with some dogmatic explanation for why it happened. But you know what? You listened to your body a little bit. You ate some foods that agreed with you. You didn't go and start binging on a bunch of pasta and junk food. You know, I mean, oats and fruit, for the most part, I would say there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not a big fan of grains, you know, but oats are kind of the least offensive of those. And, um, you know, I mean, I've, I had my day um, oats, but I was doing more Weston A price stuff before I kind of dabbled in keto. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad that you broke through that plateau. It might not have even been the carbs. It might just have been the caloric intake that needed to increase. Um, shoot, you might have been restricting your protein too much, right? If you restrict protein too much and you're working out a lot, creating a heavy stress response in the body, the body will compensate by eating more of all the macros. So they did a study and uh, what was this called? I think it was called, if you, all right, so do a Google search. The other god of the modern age, Google, Google, Google babble. Um, check out Google on the internet, the new Tower of Babel, and look up this study called, what was it called? I think the study was called the Protein Leverage Hypothesis. Look up Protein Leverage Hypothesis PDF, and hopefully you can find the full text of it. It's fascinating. Talking about how when you restrict protein in certain groups of people, um, they restricted protein. I'm going to butcher this study completely because... Um, <laughs> I don't have it right in front of me. Anyways, just look at the protein hypo the protein leverage hypothesis. When you're short on protein, people will tend to compensate and overeat all the macros, but it's mostly seems to be a response that's just people trying to get that protein in. So they end up eating more fat and more carbs in relation to the amount of protein they're getting. But when they hit that protein cap, then their satiety kicks in. You know why? Because protein is the most satiating macronutrient bar none. Fat is not the most satiating macronutrient. I don't care what any other chiropractor or some other guy out there says. Fat, eat more fat bra, is not the answer always. In some cases, some more fats might be helpful. Like perhaps King Six, who was doing weight training and obviously doing a lot of intense workouts and then increased his carbohydrates around workouts and got better results. Maybe this individual was not getting enough of the fatty acids and protein that he needed to actually supply the brain because remember, parts of the brain need glucose and supply other parts of the body that require glucose during that anaerobic and aerobic activity. Nikki Key says, preach, <laughs> stop smoking and drinking six weeks ago. Whoa, started keto at the same time. At the same time, lost 11 pounds. Feel better than I ever have. All right, Nikki Key. This is something I don't do every broadcast. We mentioned the Ketogenic Ed's cookbook earlier. Your comment right there just made my moment. So Nikiki, I'm assuming you're a female because of your name. If you're not, don't be offended. If you don't consider yourself male or female, this is probably not the channel for you. Um, <laughs> so maybe you should be offended if you don't consider yourself male or female. I don't know what you are. Nikiki. You're getting a free copy of the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, a training manual for ketogenic, low-carbohydrate, and paleo cuisine. Um, I like your comment. You stopped smoking and drinking six weeks ago. You said, I'm done. I'm taking control of my life. No more excuses. It's not his fault, that guy's fault, Obama's fault, Trump's fault, this person, that person. It's your responsibility. It's your life. And that life is the gift that was given to you. It was bestowed upon you. And you're taking control of it. You're taking it in your hands. And you're honoring that body. 
You started keto six weeks ago. I want you to look at this book. I, I hope this book helps you to continue building a solid foundation of habits to keep you healthy, thriving, and enjoying your life. I hope this can be a blessing to you. Nikiki, I want you to put your email, Nikiki, <laughs> put your email in the text here, and I'm going to email you and hook you up with a copy of our book. Put your email in here. All right. Every once in a while, I like to give away a copy of the book or hook someone up. Uh, don't come on here and ask for a copy of the book. That's not how it works every once in a while. I like to do it though. So, Nikiki, if I don't hear from you, then email me, Tristan at primaledgehealth.com. Actually, no, because then someone else could do it. Put your name in here, Nikiki. I'm going to look out for it. Mutant Stoner, what's up, man? James Cho, what's up, James Cho? 17 minutes late. Yeah, but you're all right, man. You'll catch up. <laughs> Pamela Shaw says, inflammatory issues are almost gone, but I only eat clean now. Pasture-raised, organic, no sugar, no starch. Congratulations. You're finding out what works for you. You're testing the waters, and you're doing your best to take control of that situation, to take control of the habits that you formed. Nikiki, I'm looking for your – I want. I need your email. You better put your email in here, Nikiki, or someone else is going to get that book. All right, Deanna DeLong, what's up? Checking in from Belgium. She says, please tell Jessica I will be buying her cookbook. <laughs> You've sold me. On another note, what advice can you give a newbie to this way of eating and menopause nightmare? All right, menopause nightmare. All right, we don't even sell this anymore. We used to have maca on the website, but I'll tell you where you can get good maca. Uh, first of all, premenopause and menopause symptoms can be greatly helped through the use of certain adaptogens, namely maca. So I want you to look into maca as you know, for use for menopause and premenopause symptoms. Get yourself some maca. I'm going to give you a little hint. There's a lot of crap material out there. There's a lot of low quality, very poor stuff out there. And unfortunately, um, most of the companies out there are marketing low quality material that are not good. But you can get really good maca from the rawfoodworld.com. Uh, the guy that runs that website, I know him. He's a vegan dude. Don't judge him for it. He's a nice person. Get it from the will not be the maltodextrin crap that a lot of people sell that gives people weird side effects sometimes because it's maltodextrin, not maca. Um, <clears throat> Check that out. Another thing, make sure you're not stressing your body out far too good. Or far too good. I started reading a, uh, a comment. Make sure you're not stressing your body out too much. So you're starting this new way of eating. You're starting to, um, you're also going through menopause. You're a newbie. First of all, you want to make sure that protein macro is getting hit. You're hitting that protein every day. Now, for most people, about 1.5 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of your lean body mass and, or if you look at it in pounds, 0.8 grams per pound of your lean body mass will be sufficient protein for you. So get enough protein. Keep your carbs low. Carbs should stay low. Under 30 grams net carb, 20 to 30 grams net carb is enough. Um, keep those carbs low, and fat is your energy source. That's how you formulate your macros. Then you're moving forward from there, make sure, or uh, actually, let me say this. Fat is your energy source. And in the beginning, you want some more of that energy substrate from diet. You don't want to just force yourself to burn a bunch of body fat right away. Then you prune back the fat when your hunger drops. You prune back that fat and you burn your own body fat if the goal is body fat loss. Nikki, Nikiki, I hope you come back. If you don't come back, it's okay. Um, We'll talk some other time, I guess. But um, it seems like you checked out early. You know, what did they say? You snooze, you lose. But you don't lose. You're winning. Regardless of if you get in touch with me, um, take me up on that offer and let me hook you up. Even without that, you quit drinking, you quit smoking, and you're taking control of your diet at the same time. These are huge steps. This can be a miraculous change, a major fit, uh, phase shift in your life. And I really hope. You continue on that path and continue coming closer to the truth, to standing in that truth, to speaking the truth, and actually manifesting the truth in your life, right? Because it really what it all comes down to is our own connection to something far bigger than us, something far more powerful, powerful than us, something far more pure than us. And, um, you know, by cleaning out the gunk in our life and stopping the things that, 
offend our spirit, stopping doing the things that make us weak, the things that are detrimental to our character and detrimental to our health. Because anything that's detrimental to our character is going to be detrimental to our health as well, and vice versa. All right. Julie Summer, what's up? Julie says, how do you use maca? You just eat it. <laughs> um, first of all, make sure you're getting it from a good source. The only good source out there that I know of right now is going to be the rawfoodworld.com. But um, yeah, I, I, I like to mix it in sometimes with a little bit of MCT because I like how it tastes with the oil. Some people put it in smoothies. I like the way maca tastes. Some people don't. Jen Dines talking about hot flashes, brain fog, stuff like that. You know, I don't know if... If you haven't tried maca yet, which you said you bought red maca, um, you said it makes your heart race. Well, that's a shame. Maybe it's a low-quality maca. I don't know where you're getting it from. But like I said before, a lot of it is maltodextro maca. Um, and people put – they'll put wheat powder in there to water it down before it's even exported. It's um, unfortunately – Benjamin Scally. What do you mean you're still waiting for the cookbook? All right, Benjamin Scally says he's still waiting on the cookbook. You need to check your email, man. The download link gets sent to your email. Benjamin Scally, email me at Tristan at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. We'll get you taken care of, man. Something must have happened with your spam folder, and you didn't get your download link. So just hit me up. I'll give you a new one. Excuse me. Ugh. Almost sneezed, but didn't. <laughs> All right. What's going on here? Cat D says, wait, you can't have coffee? No, you can have coffee. I never said you can't have coffee. If somebody tells you you can't have coffee on this diet or you can't do this on this diet, you can't step on a crack or you break your mama's back. Question why they say that. Question it. Why? Why can't I have coffee? There's no reason why you cannot have coffee on a ketogenic diet. I was just making a joke because a lot of people come on here and ask me, oh, can I have coffee? Because they've been told that for some reason they may not eat coffee. As if, you know, gurus on the internet grant us the ability to eat certain foods on a ketogenic diet, right? Like it's bestowed on us by some guru on YouTube. Bestowed upon you. All right. Benjamin Scally says, suffering tolerance related to decision making and changes in lifestyle. I have a lower tolerance for suffering, poor decisions than when I used to, whether eating, self-indulgence of various forms, the way I treat people. My tolerance for suffering, the temporary discomfort in making corrections and challenging myself in various ways has went way up. Benjamin, that's beautifully stated, man. Let me read that again. My tolerance for suffering, the temporary discomfort, temporary discomforts in making corrections and challenging myself in various ways has went way up. Benjamin, that's a really, really good comment. That's fantastic, man. Um, I almost don't even need to add anything to that. It's like the language there. Temporary discomfort, right? When we make decisions, when we make sacrifices in order to grow, in order to become a better individual, in order to better serve those around us, in order to better to come closer to the truth, it is temporarily discomforting, right? Sometimes getting those layers of false reality pulled from us can be straight up traumatic. You know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've just you know, reached that point where – I can't keep going like this. You know, I can't keep having these repetitive thoughts. I can't keep focusing on the wrong thing all the time. I can't keep treating myself like this or treating the people around me like this. Sometimes it can be so overwhelming that it feels like, like we're dying or something. You know, it's like the last, you know, the gnawing, clawing layers of the false reality getting pulled from us. Some people call it ego, whatever you want to call it. Um, when it gets stripped from us, it can feel like a layer of skin being ripped off. But then the newfound freedom in our slightly expanded reality when we come out of those self-imposed cages that we close the door on ourselves for so long, the freedom and the just amazing feeling of actually growing and, um, and stripping off that falseness and seeing ourselves in more clear of a light and seeing others and seeing reality in more clear of a light um, and being able to make decisions like you've made, man. Um, far outweighs the temporary discomfort of having to go a few days without precious sugar or, you know, stopping getting pissed drunk every night and acting like a jerk to our spouse or, you know, using pharmaceutical drugs um, to escape from real responsibilities of having consciousness, of having those eyes and that heart that you were given. 
Um, it's fantastic. DeWitt Sagastoon. What's up, DeWitt? All right. Angie Lee says, I love coffee and matcha green tea mixed in. Yummy. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, nothing wrong with coffee, guys. I was just making a little, kind of a little joke there. Um, of course, you don't want to be adding sugar to your coffee. And um, the heavily marketed bulletproof coffee stuff is not really necessary and doesn't do anything special. You know, if you're going to drink coffee and you're going for fat loss, drink that coffee black. Unless you really need to get some fats in for your macros and you really enjoy the taste of cream in your coffee or something like that. But hey, putting butter in your coffee, it doesn't do anything special. Sorry, guys. It's great marketing. Fantastic marketing. Little Big Head says, can you explain muscle glycogen and lifting weights? All right. So lifting weights requires glycogen, requires some glucose, but doesn't require as much as most people think. And you don't need carbs pre-workout. There you go. Cool. James Cho. Cool, man. You don't require carbohydrates pre-workout to refill that glycogen. So in the context of a ketogenic diet, which is I'm assuming what you're asking, because a lot of people come here for information on low-carbohydrate diets and how to properly implement a ketogenic diet. Now, in the context of... Got water on my paper. In the context of a ketogenic diet, your body will refill those glycogen stores. Shoot, even in the absence of all food, the body will refill those glycogen stores in less than 24 hours. So your body is able to generate the glucose it needs from the glycerol backbone of fatty acids. And in most lifting activity, you're, you're using a lot of fatty acids, especially if it's not explosive, super heavy lifts. Um, you know, most of your warm up lifts and most of just your general contractions of the muscle, you're using fatty acids effectively. The glycerol backbone of those fatty acids can be turned into glucose as necessary. And your liver and your body will partition that glucose to the parts that need it. So during workouts and exercise and afterwards, your body can refill that glycogen. Even the most intense anaerobic training does not deplete glycogen by more than like 40%. It's nearly impossible to completely deplete glycogen. Um, so if you're doing keto, if you're doing low carb and you've been told, oh, you can't lift heavy weights, you need glucose for that. It's, that's just not true. Plenty of people do it. Plenty of people have been doing it for years. So there you go. Mariana 99. What's up? She says, I want to understand how is the body functioning until it gets adapted when it's not using carbs anymore, but doesn't know how to use fat yet. Well, it's always using both carbs and fat. The body doesn't just like shut down. I'm not using, I'm not in ketosis. Ah, or I'm in ketosis. Ah, you know, there's ketosis is not the metabolism isn't a binary system. It's not like a computer with a bunch of ones and zeros, keto, not keto. It's not how it works. There's a whole spectrum of energy usage in the body. Different parts of the body are using glucose at all times or ketones at sometimes. There's it's much more, it's not so simple as, you know, glucose bad, ketones good. While you're adapting, your body will not be as efficient as using ketones as it does once you're fat adapted, once you get adapted to using those ketones. So we all know, or not as we all know, but as the scientific literature shows, a ketogenic diet can improve mitochondrial biogenesis. In fact, you need that mitochondrial biogenesis to burn those ketones, to use ketones for energy. So you've got to generate more mitochondria. And for the first few weeks, some people might feel malaise. Some people might not feel as strong. Some people might just feel a little bit off. But as long as you get in your electrolytes, for the most part, these symptoms are not so bad. They're totally manageable. And after a few weeks, energy comes back. Strength and stamina start to come back. And anaerobic and aerobic performance can start improving and training can get back to normal moving forward. All right. James Cho says, temporary discomfort is our friend and should be embraced as it allows us to grow physically, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. Absolutely. I mean, what is, I mean, anytime somebody does physical training, you're intentionally putting yourself in an uncomfortable state. But a lot of the times it can backfire because then you're intentionally putting yourself in the same uncomfortable state that then becomes comfortable and you're overtraining certain muscle patterns and stuff like that. And then it can become a stressor. So it's actually all about dynamic movement. It's about moving in different ways, challenging the body, the mind, the spirit in different ways, and not just a straightforward linear focus, myopic focus on, you know, this is what I do or that's what I do. We need 
dynamic interaction with our environment. Um, and the temporary discomfort of rearranging our relationship with our environment just comes from those old habits trying to stay ingrained, right? It's like we made those old habits because they helped us survive in a certain way, right? And our consciousness, our conscious wants to hold on to some of these habits because it thinks that it needs them, right? We're eating the junk food and stuff like that in order to regulate brain chemistry a lot of the times, in order to regulate our dopamine levels because we might have low dopamine and aren't able to generate it naturally. Um, you know, we might be doing it to um, opiate ourselves in order to stop chronic pain and discomfort, but then it creates this negative feedback loop that creates more inflammation, more pain, and more discomfort. So sometimes actually dealing with the discomfort of removing the offensive food that creates inflammation from, um, you know, the temporary discomfort of, you know, going and soaking in a cold bath or, you know, going and doing a sauna and just flushing out the body of a lot of the, um, you know, the water and the toxic load that gets emitted through or, you know, doing cold exposure, uh, taking ice baths, stuff like that. A temporary discomfort can yield great results. Um, you know, also the temporary discomfort of like getting off drugs. I mean, anybody who's quit pharmaceutical drugs, alcohol, um, any of these highly addictive substances knows that it is hellish sometimes. I mean, it feels like, like you just got demons being ripped from you when you're trying to quit some of this stuff. Uh, but that discomfort, when you come out the other end, when you reach that light at the end of the tunnel, that discomfort is so worth it. And you know, I mean, so the, some of the hardest experiences that we can have, some of the things that when at the time that happened to me, I thought, oh, this is terrible. I don't know if I can deal with this. Later on, looking back, it's always, you know, it's grateful or it's grateful. I'm grateful. I have gratitude towards it because, you know, those difficulties are what help us to grow. Let's see. Daywit says, how can I eat keto to lose weight while breastfeeding? Good question. You want to make, well, first of all, I'm not a doctor, but also you want to make sure that you want to make sure that you're getting enough nutrients for that kid. Uh, focusing on nutrient dense food, like wild caught fish, getting a lot of DHA in. It's been shown that high DHA levels in the mother's diet will transfer to better brain growth and functionality of the central nervous system in those kids. So getting in foods like, you know, grass fed, wild caught liver, stuff like that, um, yeah, uh, that can be fantastic for the kids. Uh, you just want to make sure you're not starving yourself completely and, um, you know, having to deal with your body processing the toxic load from some of the fats that are stored in our body, right? Because a lot of times we'll store toxic load with the fats because the liver is so insulin resistant and doesn't want to deal with it at the time. So you don't want to just be dumping those toxins in your system the whole time. You want to be. You want to be. Um, giving your kid the nourishment that your child deserves and needs, but maintaining that slight deficit. Uh, it's definitely possible, and you can definitely do it. All right, K. Jordan. What's up, K. Jordan? says, I've only been doing this for six weeks. I'm so thankful for what you said about how weight fluctuates. Focusing on how you feel. I'm losing two pounds a week. I haven't lost like this in 10 years. There you go. Exactly. Foc focus on how you feel, right? I mean, this is this is one of the crazy thing about like the modern world, you know, given all this technology and stuff like that. And it can be we think it's going to be liberating us. We think it's going to be so helpful. Um, but sometimes it just enslaves us and traps us. So we've got constant barrage of these ways to measure metrics. We've got these uh, Fitbit devices uh, that are known carcinogens, you know, I mean, using radio frequency, constantly barraging your DNA is known to cause cancer. Uh, but people are rocking around with these Fitbits thinking that they're doing themselves good. They're basically radiating, them, radiating themselves with Wi-Fi all day with it. Um, and then you've got people start a ketogenic diet, right? You want to lose body fat. You want to get healthy. Um, shoot, you just want to feel a little bit better, be a little bit more clear headed, stop crashing throughout the day, lose 10 pounds, 100 pounds, whatever it is. And you come upon all this information online and it can be overwhelming. People are telling you, you've got to do this and that. You can't drink coffee. You can't step on a crack. You break your mama's back. You can't, you know, you can't do anything when you're on a ketogenic diet. And it can be overwhelming. You only got to measure my blood ketones and my blood glucose every five minutes. When it's like, if you just stop and you look back at the reason when you started this diet, why did you start it? Did you start it so that you can be constantly, you know, P 
peeing on your fingernails on these stupid pee strips that tell you nothing about how you feel, what your progress is. Um, you do it so you can be pricking yourself in your finger all day long, measuring a, your worth to yourself, your self-value, um, how well you're doing in life by a stupid number telling you how many ketones you have, which really means nothing. No, that's not the reason you got into this. You got into this to feel good, to enjoy your life, so that you can spend your life meaningfully doing things that you care about rather than measuring your blood ketones and pissing in your fingernails all dang day. Um, so just taking a step back and thinking, okay, what matters to me? What do I want out of this? But for me, what I want out of my diet is not 1.5, 2.0 blood ketone meter. I could care less. It doesn't correlate with how I feel here and here. Um, for me, I want to have stable energy throughout the day. I want to be able to handle the daily stressors of my life. I want to be able to move my body without impingement, without loads of inflammation. I want to have stable blood sugar, which I can feel because I don't crash and get hungry constantly. And I want to be able to spend my life meaningfully, right? To do what I want to do with my time. And um, so if I feel good, if I'm losing body fat and my body is reacting well to it, I'm not going to worry about what these useless pee strips tell me. I'm not going to be measuring my blood ketones every five minutes or after and before every meal or after I sneeze every time. Um, I'm going to actually pay attention to how I feel. I'm going to pay attention to how low my stress levels are, to how I'm able to handle minor stressors or things that don't go my way throughout the day. Because that's what's important is life, not stupid numbers. <laughs> so of course, if you're a diabetic, yeah, you're going to test your blood glucose and stuff like that. But it's all about the context, guys. Boxa says, I found that onions, especially raw onions, spike my insulin that triggers insane hunger. I admitted onions after the beginning of keto. Who'd have thunk? Yeah, you know, I mean, there's certain foods that can be trigger foods for some people. It's, <laughs> Yeah. And you got to listen to your body. So that's really cool that you figured that out. And just because onions don't work for you doesn't mean that you should go preaching to the world, screaming it from the rooftops, that thou must not eat onions on keto because me, the guru, has must bestow permission upon you for what you can eat. Um, just because onions might trigger you doesn't mean they might trigger Sally Joe or Jimmy James down the street. Ruminatic Poetry, what's up? Arnie Slab, Boxa, Jane. All right. Ruminatic says, were you ever in the rat race or did you grow up with parents that were? In other words, how'd you end up in Ecuador? You seem to have an appreciation for the essentials that isn't common in the U.S. Man. At, see, I, I don't know. I always, I'm always remiss. When someone asks me to tell a story about myself, it's funny, funny, funny because it's like, First of all, there's a camera on me. So that changes behavior, right? Anybody, I mean, I've been obsessed with filmmaking my whole life. And I've always been fascinated how putting cameras on people changes their behavior. Um, especially interesting to me now, now that everybody's allowed cameras all over. I got like five cameras pointed at me right now that Google can look at at any point. Facebook can tap into. It's all been admitted. NSA, stuff like that. So Panopticon society is fascinating. Was I ever in the rat race? I mean, I, I grew up in California, man. I grew up in Southern California, um, the suburbs of California, among the beautiful blue-eyed blondes of Riverside, California, the blue-eyed, empty-headed, empty-hearted bimbos. I'm not saying that that's how most people are, but that's, I mean, that's, I experienced it, you know. I, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in the public school system. Uh, I went to University of California, Santa Cruz, one of the most like liberal schools in California. And you know, I was, I don't know. I've, I've lived a lot of different little lives within this one lifetime here. Did I, was I ever in the rat race? I never, I don't know. I never felt like I was. I never, I never submitted consciously to the, you know, keeping up with the Joneses nonsense, right? I mean, we all know when we're kids or, you know, we all, but I, I don't know. I mean, just, I, I saw aspects of the culture that I didn't like, but I'd never seen something outside of it, right? It's like we're raised on this corporate media, raised on the Disney movies, you know, the Disney princess programming, um, you know, and what's, what's the story behind every Disney movie we get shown as a kid, um, 
first of all, it's a child born into a weird situation, doesn't get proper love from the parents. And usually the parents are either dead or super abusive. And then they get plopped into the hands of some witch. Usually, I mean, look at say, a Snow White or uh, Sleeping Beauty. Um, you know, and then somebody else comes over and takes over and finishes the, uh, the abusive programming of their psyche until they become the beautiful, dazzling princess on the outside. And they realize that they always were this beautiful, dazzling princess on the inside too. Now the inside matches. It's just funny programming, right? I don't even know why I'm talking about this. I don't know how I got from the rat race to Disney, but yeah, you know, I mean, I grew up in this, the lucky charms, the, um, the, the emphasis on the most important thing you can do, you got to get, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to college? Are you going to go to college? What are you going to do? What are you going to do after high school? And I mean, when I, when I graduated high school, I didn't really want to go to the university. I, I, it was part of the generation that was, we kind of knew before that the university education was kind of useless already. Um, but I was given the opportunity to go to university and, um, you know, I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> My parents helped me do it. It was fantastic. Uh, I had a good time. I, I was thinking about not going. I, I thought I would be just as happy, like, you know, living in Carlsbad, California on the beach, just, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't have that ambition to ever like, I didn't have economic ambition is what I'm saying. I just wanted to be comfortable. I wanted to be free. That's what's important to me. It's not money. It's not image. It's not what your body looks like. It's not this person thinking you're cool. It's not being accepted by your neighbors. Although I've fallen into many of those traps many a times in my life. Um, you know, I mean, what's important to me is what's real, is what's true. And I've always just been fascinated with the mysteries of life. And that's what I ponder on as I'm walking through this world. And um, yeah, and I lived in Santa Cruz for a while. Liked it. Couldn't afford it. But uh, yeah, what, what's been important to me is freedom. What's important to me is not just... It's not just like my decisions on what I do with my time and my energy. I mean, that's sacred, right? That is so valuable. Um, but it's also just the freedom to, to think freely and to ask questions and to have my own opinions. You know, that's been important to me. And that's not something that I felt was actually uh, promoted in, um, you know, in the environment that I grew up in. And I'm not complaining at all, right? I had a great childhood. I loved it. I loved living in the suburbs, cruising around on my bike, building bike jumps and, um, you know, skinning my knee, getting into trouble, um, you know, growing up, becoming seven years old, getting my first job at in and out Burger, hating working there, but liking the people that I was around, liking that I had my own money and my own responsibility. And I was able to afford getting this little crappy car that I first bought. Um, and then, yeah. My next job was really fun. I was a bellman at this like upper class resort. And I was working like the service industry and stuff as a kid. I was good with dealing with people. I like people. I connect with people. And uh, I grew up with a lot of anxiety at times. But when I'm not in that neurotic, anxious state, I, you know, I really enjoy connecting with people. And uh, so, yeah, I worked as a bellman shuttle driver and like had this little minivan I'd cruise around Carlsbad with. Got into some trouble at that job. <laughs> um, it was fun, you know. But I didn't want to stay there. I don't know. It's not like you ever can leave the – like you always have to support yourself economically no matter where you live in the world unless you want to join some hunter-gatherer tribe, which is not going to happen, which nobody does. And, you know, we're just not equipped for that anymore. But, I mean, you've got to, we've got to support ourselves. We have to be engaged in some sort of economic activity. But I think it's so – it's just been incredible that um, – I don't know, the internet and all this this whole thing, while at one on one end of the spectrum it is – consolidating the thought forms of humanity um and it's a massive control grid i mean look at google google has been able and i've been watching google filter and censor things for the last decade and a half um but you can see i mean google basically has the ability now to format and edit reality for most people and it's amazing and it's it's really it's frightening in some ways but at the same time it's like we're still able to put out content like this you know i mean it's getting tighter and tighter with censorship and everything but um yeah i mean it's this this platform right here being able to communicate with people all around the world to meet people that are similar to me that have similar drive similar intentions similar belief similar faith in the good nature of 
our creator who gives us this life, who gave us this vessel and um, gives us free will to be able to choose how to live. Um, I love being able to communicate with all you guys. And actually, I've been given a platform here to where I can support myself, my family economically while feeling good about what I do. And that's always something that I struggled with was like, I wanted to feel good about what I did. I felt guilty. I was I, mean, like, I didn't want I felt guilty paying taxes because I knew where it was going. This was bombing people all over the world, regime change all over the world in the name of freedom and democracy. Um, you know, and it's like these things always irritated me, but you know what? It's like we can't control these meta realities. We can only control what we put out into the world and what we choose to engage with economically, spiritually, physically, on every level. And um, yeah, that's my trip is just trying to hone that in, hone in my reason why. Nikiki. <laughs> All right. James Cho says, Disney is lots of subliminal messages in it that promote promiscuity. <sighs> it's worse than just that. I mean, it's, I mean, Disney, the whole programming behind Disney is not just sexual promiscuity, but like, I mean, look at Beauty and the Beast. What is that? I mean, just straight up bestiality right there. Are you freaking kidding me? And it's always, you know, the, 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 ch the child is abused and their psyche gets fractured and broken. They lose their parents, you know, Simba loses his father, and then you've got the evil scar, and he's you know, trying to deal with this reconciliation. I mean, it's, it's full of the, the age-old esoteric occult um, symbols that have been used for thousands and thousands of years to represent these deeper transcendent realities. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of the Disney, my friend. I agree with you, James Cho, but that's not what this is about. We're not here to talk about Disney programming for kids. We're here about... We're here to unprogram, to deprogram, and to reprogram ourselves consciously with a deeper connection to life, with a deeper connection to what is true, what is real, and what is righteous. Because you know in your heart when you're doing something that's not right. You know in your heart when you're doing something that's creating nonsense and confusion in the world. And we should be striving for the exact opposite of that. <laughs> Ruminatic poetry says the crappy car. Yeah, man, I'm there now. Yeah, you see, that's the thing. But what the sad thing is, is even in those times when I, you know, I had, you know, 16, 17 years old, and I enjoyed it to a certain extent. But, you know, even looking back, I know there was parts of me that were still suffering unnecessarily through it. If that makes any sense to you. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't even know like how to finish that thought. All right. Does it snow where you are, Tristan? It doesn't snow in this spot where I am, but there's a million different microclimates all around Ecuador. And several hours away from here, we can get to snow-capped volcanoes. We can also get to the, uh, the coast in a few hours, in about six hours, four to six hours. We can also get to the jungle in about an hour and a half. So it's pretty crazy. DeWitt says, what was your major? At first, I started majoring in... Uh, engineering. Then I got over that. Then I started thinking about becoming a doctor, but then I quickly decided, well, I kind of knew subconsciously all along, uh, but I was, you know, thinking about maybe getting a doctor and trying to do something a little bit more alternative. Not going to happen. I mean, the whole biology department, anybody who's been through the university of California understands where the funding comes from and what that career path looks like. And it ain't for me. Uh, it's not for anybody who asks questions and free thinks. Um, so then I started looking at, uh, psychology. <laughs> I was like, and then I realized that the psychology departments were kind of full of people who don't understand people, which is weird. I mean, the whole Freudian thing, all this Freudian nonsense. Um, I had interest in like Reich's theories and stuff like that. And some of these other things I was interested in RD Lang and stuff like that. But I, I got out of that. I wasn't so interested in that. Didn't want to join the, uh, the psychiatric, um, community, the psychologist, become a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, so then I studied history, which is what I really wanted to learn about anyways. Um, and I was actually able to um, program most of my, uh, my learning and what I, uh, what I studied as a history major. So yeah, a liberal arts student, a liberal arts student. And I'm not a green haired lesbian. <laughs> fighting the patriarchy, although that's who I went to school with. You know, I mean, I remember I took the class, uh, 
with a purple haired lesbian teacher all about how um, adventure is um, completely owned by the the patriarchy. It was like, it was the most nonsense course I've ever seen in my life. It was so ridiculous. I was laughing my whole way through it. Um, I got an A in it. I went to one lecture. Uh, but yeah, it was all about like, you know, smash the patriarchy. Male, white male privilege allows you to explore, but us poor females are so, it was just nonsense, like crazy. Like the, the university system, especially University of California, like Berkeley. I mean, look at all the, look at the history of UC Berkeley, UC Davis, the programming that has happened there, these stunts for these political stunts that have been happening there lately and in the 60s, these fake orchestrated um, events. Very, very interesting. So yeah, I grew up in all that stuff, all of it. Jordan says, K. Jordan says, I was borderline diabetic, but after six weeks, my sugar is around 80. I was so scared to be on medication. This lifestyle is so worth it. But look, K. Jordan, I mean, don't you want to live a little? Don't you miss the cake and the pizza? No, you don't, because you realize that that temporary discomfort of dropping those addictive habits is just a drop in the pond from the bliss that you experienced, from the rapture that you experienced, from actually enjoying life and treating your body well. This is amazing, right? Treat your body right. All right. I wish Nikiki would come back and get her free cookbook, but that's all right. Um, all right, let's talk. Do you enjoy reading about quantum physics? No, it's nonsense. Einstein, nonsense. Quantum physics, fake nonsense. I'm fascinated with some of the work of Nikola Tesla, the actual files, the actual um, papers that he wrote and his patents. Some of that stuff is fantastic. I mean, at the, top, at the highest level of physics, they know that all this stuff, this just fake esoteric nonsense, quantum physics, spooky action at a distance, nonsense. Baloney is for the dogs. You, I mean, you think Lockheed Martin is concerned with quantum physics? No, it's electrogravitics that they're playing with over there. Those are the big boy toys, TR3Bs and whatnot. Hannah Hoogan, what's up? <laughs> Ruminatic Poetry says academia is a hamster wheel. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure, man. Uh, but actually, I enjoyed the history departments because I chose, I picked and chose like what I studied. Um, and it was cool. It was really cool. I enjoyed it a lot. Arnie Slab, what's up? All right. DeWitt says, grew up in the East Bay, though. Right on. My, my wife grew up in Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa, California. I grew up in San Diego. San Diego. San Diego. <laughs> Pamela says, I miss Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is pretty cool. Santa Cruz is nice. I don't miss it, though. I mean, there's certain that I would love to experience, but just like that, you, know, you give some things up when you want to experience other things. Dream Scorcher says, hello, PEH. <laughs> I started keto four days ago. Calorie deficit, equal fat and protein and veggies with intermittent fasting, fasted hit cardio, 20% body fat currently. What should I start expecting results? When should I start expecting results? Don't know. But I'm glad you're doing what feels good to you. I don't know what results you're expecting or what you want from it. Keep moving forward and enjoy your life. All right, KLMN says, Tristan, greetings, brother. Thanks to you, I managed to start keto. Thanks for all the information you give freely on YouTube. I'm ready to go on and get shredded. Right on, man. <laughs> all right. Okay. Hold on. All right, what do you guys want to talk about? Arnie Slab says, I guess I'm glad my kids hate Disney now. Yeah, and I, I I used to, I liked The Lion King, I remember when I was a kid. But, I mean, you start to see the patterns and the programs that are running in these shows. I mean, it's all just about ritual abuse of children. It's about the ritual abuse of children. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's about the ritual abuse of children and the occult personality and the little fairy godmothers that grant you favors. The fairy godmother shows up. Hey, you want to be a princess for a night? I can do that for you. I'm your fairy god. 